everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to our post, breast our first post COVID meeting JCC after a long stretch of leave. So we have lots to discuss and lots to listen to today. Without any further ado, I will be going to declarations of interest. Anyone have any declarations of interest? No? Apologies for absence. I received one apology. Um, just to say that um, Councillor Cooper Marbia said she may be late. She's going to try and attend to, to okay. give her apologies to the meeting. Okay. Yeah, Chair, there's also apologies from Mr. Islam from the Bangladeshi Association. Also, Superintendent Roger, Roger Arditi. Unfortunately, he was meant oh, yeah. to be on the agenda, but he's ill. Uh, yeah. He's been taken ill suddenly, so he won't be able to attend tonight. Um, could I have the apology that you have, Councillor, just for the notes? I just have Caroline for late. Okay. Mr. Mr. Islam. Okay. And no one else. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. We'll move to item number three, minutes of the previous meeting. That was a long time ago. Has the minutes been agreed? Yep. I heard no dissent, so we'll accept it. Now we move on to item number four, findings of the BME Voice COVID-19 Community Resilience Research. And this, is this by Hannah Neal, I guess? Sorry, the research, the research was conducted by BME Voice, but the presentation will be um, Hannah Neal, Edward Malarkey, and we also have um, some council representatives. So. It's a joint presentation. We'll be starting off with BME Voice. Okay. Can people see my screen? Yes, thanks. Yes. Okay. Hannah, so I think it's in your hands. If you tell me when, I will move forward through the slide deck. If you could put the first uh, slide on, please. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I'm here presenting um, with Edward Maliki um, this report, which we presented um, to the Health and Wellbeing Forum last week. And um, we reported our initial findings to the JCC. Uh, Interim report was presented to the JCC in December last year, and we're here today to present a full report as promised. Slide two, please, John. Now, the body of work um, the Health and Wellbeing uh, Board gave us was to gain a genuine insight into the lived experiences of AME communities um, as a result of COVID-19's impact on their health, concentrating on those communities who had been most affected by the virus. And as all of you will know, those communities were identified as the Bangladeshi community, the Pakistani community, East, West and Southern African uh, communities and the Caribbean and Tamil communities. There was the additional task of looking at the wider existing inequalities within East Merton, where a population growth is fastest and which already has higher levels of deprivation and a more diverse population than in the more affluent parts of the borough. Now, BAME Voice, in accepting the commission, stressed the need for the work to be BAME-led. It was important for us that um, it was led by uh, BAME people, uh, capturing the authentic and previously unheard voices of those communities and using the traditional uh, means of communication that would be relevant to those uh, communities.
Now, we also stressed that we didn't propose reiterating um, the overwhelming evidence citing systemic racism as the overriding factor in the inequalities which VAME communities come against in every aspect of their lives. These are very well known and documented facts and we didn't feel it would be useful going over them again and again. And so it was gratifying when we went out into the field and started a dialogue with people, but whilst acknowledging the existence of racism and condemning it in all its forms, the people that we spoke to gave us their permission for this piece of work at least to reveal new insights, to shake off the dust from existing recommendations and provide decision makers with the tools that they needed to bring about lasting support to their area of East Merton. All wanted the anger and there was considerable anger expressed, paneled towards providing a level playing field. Um, people we spoke to didn't want any preferential treatment. What they wanted was a level playing field for all those who live in the borough. We have the next slide, please. So we see here um, the ratio, the graphs that we've prepared and Mohammed Batha, who did most of the work on these slides is unable to be with us uh, today. But you can see here that we spoke to approximately 300 people, 180 females, 120 males, and 45 of these were young people <laughs> from ages of nine to 25. In fact, there was one young man who was uh, actually seven years old and we like to start them early. <laughs> but in terms of ethnicity, the first half of the program had larger numbers of Asian residents. Now the second half, um, because of the projected increase um, among Afro-Caribbean residents, uh, getting the, the virus. So the, that second, um, the second half of the program, which started um, in November and ended in February, we interviewed and talked to more people from the Afro-Caribbean community because it had been projected that these communities would be the ones that would be most affected. So we try to meet the brief, as it were, in terms of um, going to the most affected, which was the Asian communities in the first half of our, our work and going to the Afro-Caribbean communities in the second half um, of our work. So we used a variety of communication methods and um, we used pods, what we, we called pods, which were groups of 12 people, 10 to 12 meeting in their pods. These would be people who would normally meet either you know, together in, in community, or they would perhaps have a WhatsApp group or some kind of connection. They already had a connection. And so we talked to those in pods. We had face-to-face -face interviews and workshops when we were allowed to. And obviously, you know, there were periods when we couldn't do this. We had quite a lot of online interviews, speaking to a variety of people from different backgrounds and, of course, different ethnicities. And there was a virtual resilience workshops, which we did mainly with a Merton Council staff. Um, and then we had emails and phone calls, obviously, those were the main ways of communicating with people. We also did um, a number of outside promotional events where we actually went out and met people where they were rather than expecting them to come to us. We went to them, so we were in the shopping centers. We were in various other settings, social settings, to just spread the word to, to people. Mm -hmm. Now, the occupation majority were in um, education. The next slide, please, John. Uh, were in education and employment. And unfortunately, quite a lot of the um, those in employment lost their jobs. And of course, we know the chaos that ensued within the educational system because of, of COVID. 
So briefly, really, that's how the, the project went. And I'd like to hand you over to um, Edward, who would give you an insight into the findings of our project. So can we please have the next slide, please? Thank you very much, Anna, on the findings. Initially, um, we found no evidence that deaths and hospital admissions of Black, Asian, minority, ethnic residents were disproportionate their numbers within the map. But subsequent information has shown Merton's figures to be in keeping with other parts of London. Communities most affected by the virus were similar to those in other parts of London. However, projected high levels of infections among Caribbean and African communities did not occur in Merton. Um, can you say something about the council's actions who helped a lot? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Can you speak up because I can barely hear you? Oh, all right. Um, the council's actions were valued in a number of ways. Uh, council took some actions that helped in the implementation of the project. And, um, and the first one is that there was swift, swift action in working with everyone to provide much needed support that averted any chaos or confusion. Setting up of Merton Giving was another initiative that helped a lot. Collaborative effort by the community or the community allowed many organizations and groups to help their respective communities. The Merton community led by the council coming out to support and help each other. And the council and the clinical commissioning groups and other agencies wanting to learn from the losses suffered by Black, Asian, minority ethnic people. However, having said that, historical issues of systemic racism as the overriding factor in the inequalities which BAME communities encounter, expressed by 80% of those who were interviewed. Uh, real anger was expressed that long identified and promised changes to the inequalities in East Merton had not materialized. Having said that, um, there is some hope, but uh, with anger, there's hope. Hope was expressed that this time, the reality of life for BAME communities highlighted by the pandemic would bring about much needed change. Echo the cry of the majority of people of color in the UK. No more talking, no more setting of committees to investigate. The facts are known, the needs are identified. Now what is required is action. Next slide, please. So what were the key recommendations emerging from the work that was completed um, in four categories, health, education, employment, and uh, general. Uh, health, uh, senior clinical commissioning groups, and health well-being board officials uh, to meet the BAME organizations and communities on a regular basis. That will help you actually keep in touch with what is existing experiences of these communities. Um, Pop-up health hubs within community spaces distribute health messages, information, and advice. In partnership with BAME groups, develop and implement COVID-19 education and prevention campaigns, um, review doctor-patient relationships. Uh, it's evident that in fact, during this change where doctors were not as accessible to clients as they used to be, uh, it did, did present a challenge that needs to be looked at now to improve it further. Cultural competence training for all health workers every three years. Cultural competence is so important you know, that you interpret the behavior of clients based on your understanding of their culture rather than uh, from a perspective of Eurocentric uh, expectation. Regular assertive resilience skills workshops for BAME staff and the public kept informed about plans for improvements, East Merton, e.g. the Wilson Community Center. Uh, I believe there was a talk that the, the development that has happened at the Nelson 
that something similar was going to happen in 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 uh, East Milton, but no news about how that that's going to actually be certain uh, can happen. But we need to be to be kept abreast with, with that one, so that the community trust the built. Promises made are followed through. Education, authorities to ensure bias is stripped of forecasts and decisions for BAME student predicted grades. Um, schools to teach black history written by black authors from an early age. There's an African proverb that says, until the lion tells their stories, tales of the hunt would always glorify the hunter. Uh, you know, they, you need to get it from the lion's perspective what happened before they got trapped and killed. Uh, so it is the, the, the black perspective that needs to be coming to the forefront, in the teaching of history uh, within our school. Offer culturally appropriate psychological support for BAME children living under difficult home conditions. Ban images of starving BAME children on, on aid donation appeals in schools, churches and extra, which give an unbalanced depiction what these countries and their people are really like. It's too much focus uh, on presenting the negatives of, uh, of particularly Africa and uh, nothing ever positive comes in the news concerning uh, African countries or what is happening there. Um, employment, accelerated minority ethnic workers into more, accelerated minority ethnic workers into more senior and leadership roles on merit. That's very important. Council to provide startup business grants to BAME and other businesses and invest in communities and individuals. Encourage BAME entrepreneurship into East Milton, establish businesses to invest in smaller businesses which may have grown during lockdown. And, and general uh, comments in regarding recommendations a seat for BAME organizations at the decision-making table. Authentic minority ethnic voices uh, heard. Action to stop the stigmatization uh, of BAME people and communities, particularly on official documentation. Hard to reach, seldom heard, high risk, vaccine uh, hesitant, do not augur well for good community relations because it fosters negative perceptions of a particular group of people. The council to partner with others in setting up a foundation for sports in East Merton so that young people from these areas can showcase their talents. And finally, strengthening social capital. Few people from a position of strength provide a level playing field. And I hand over back to next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edward. This is really um, as much as we can fit into the time allotted to us. Um, all of you, I think, have been given copies of the report so that you know uh, what's in it. But I'd like, before we, we leave, to, to acknowledge a number of people. Um, and we'd like to, to thank, first of all, the amazing people in East Merton that we met. Um, we'd like to thank them for opening up their hearts to us and trusting us that we would come back with their stories and not an interpretation of their story. So you will see those stories in the report that we've given. I'd like to thank very much uh, John Dimmer, John who is handling the slides today in his other role, who's head of policy, strategy and partnerships. I'd like to thank him and the um, Health and um, Wellbeing Board for trusting us um, to, to do this work, fairly new organization that we are, but in trusting us to, to commission this work. And also to thank Everett Willis, also the Policy Strategy and Partnerships, and Barry Causer, Head of Strategic Commissioning in Public Health, Merton Council, who worked with us throughout this, that it, it's important that it's collaborating working. It's not just one group of people going out and getting it, but we, we need to work collaboratively now um, to push this across. And also to Councillor Edith McCauley, who was the then 
cabinet member for equalities whose support and guidance were invaluable to this work. So thank you very much. We have pleasure in presenting this report to the JCC. Thank you, Hannah. We will now have another presentation, then we will have questions after. So we'll now move to Dagmar. Hello and good evening and, and many thanks um, um, for giving me a little bit of your valuable time. Um, Good to hear you again, Hannah. Um, um, it is um, as um, um, powerful as it was the first time around. So um, um, thank you for sharing it um, with the JCC. I've been asked um, um, a quick presentation, two parts. First part, a quick reminder how we are um, with COVID because unfortunately it hasn't gone away. And then just a couple of um, slides, first thinkings around next steps. So if you move me on. Okay, in terms of summary messages, how we are with COVID, and it's a sort of rather brutal reminder how relevant all the work um, um, still is, that infection rates um, in the country, in London, in Southwest London, and unfortunately also in Merton, are going the wrong way. And um, it is um, particularly um, um, at this time um, in the younger age groups, um, um, those who are not yet um, um, vaccinated. Um, the increase is pretty steep. So I've been um, involved in two large outbreaks. Um, um, it's a bit busy um, um, again. There are some um, um, less worrying signs this time round. Um, so hospitalization rates, for example, haven't um, um, increased um, um, like we had in the previous waves, but um, um, I still would hold my breath because remember there is a lag um, um, period. And as you are aware, um, most of the infections now, and that is the same in Merton like anywhere else, is the what we call the Delta variant, which originated from India, but we are avoiding um, I'm calling it by places because again, it makes some um, for stigma. So if you move me on. Can you move me on? That's it. So um, um, that is a slide that um, is a reminder why we're here as well. So if you look at the right upper corner, it um, um, plots our infection rates between the west of the borough and the east. And when we were holding the infection at a reasonably low level, there was sort of crossing lines, so pottering more or less in parallel, and we're seeing the gaping again. So it's a reminder um, in that um, um, the community in the East um, is more um, vulnerable to being hit by that um, um, in pandemic. If you look at the other ones, it's quite interesting. On the left-hand side, you see us in comparison to other Southwest London boroughs, and it's a busy um, picture, but you can see Kingston um, roaring up. That's the gray line. But the black line, which we're nicely at the bottom, but now very steeply going up, that's unfortunately Merton. And the very latest, it didn't make it on your slides, is that Wandsworth is now also as steep really accelerating so we've got a problem on our hands and on the right bottom you can see this time round it is and that is fortunate in a way um, led by young people rather than the older people which obviously took the brunt um, in the previous waves if you move us on um, now our biggest tool if you remember is um, obviously sticking to the measures, but then it's vaccination. And um, a number of you have been absolutely brilliant in helping us with um, um, the promotion of vaccination. We want more vaccination uptake as widespread as possible because it's basically the best thing we've got. And lo and behold, not too unexpected, in terms of the update, um, um, there is an east-west um, um, gap um, appearing. So that's the, the, the sort of the challenge we all have. Um, if you move us on, there's some um, better news. This is a fresh slide. I'm really quite um, proud because it was hard 
um, um, to get by. Um, but this shows you now um, the um, breakdown of uptake of vaccination um, in, between ethnic um, group and all. And you can see in the upper left um, box um, by cohort, by vaccination um, cohort, and you can see in most cohorts, um, in, in the um, ethnic minorities are lagging behind. And um, on the right hand side, so you can see that we are catching up. Yeah, and that is for me, and I wanted to leave that as the, the slide that gives us hope. And, you know, some of the work that you have been beavering on in the community, this is the little green shoots um, in that we are seeing. So the biggest increase in uptake of first um, um, doses we are actually seeing in ethnic minority groups. So um, I'm, I'm really, really grateful for that. If you move me on. So now that was just giving you um, um, a very brief counter and reminder that unfortunately the challenges that the pandemic has um, 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 given us the whole last year isn't, um, isn't gone and how important um, it is um, that we are continuing to work jointly. So um, for me, the, the take home messages um, from the report and um, 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 what we want to progress is we have to recognize the structural inequalities that COVID has highlighted. And I was very grateful, Hannah, that um, you've been in a way um, um, honest, challenging, but also really constructive. So um, that um, in the report feels like we want to jointly look forward. Um, in, but I have to um, be honest enough to say um, a lot of the um, COVID disparity um, has been highlighting structural inequalities and we have to call a spade a spade. So we know about housing and there is the slightly romanticized version of the intergenerational household, but actually it's overcrowding and that is just not good and not romantic and we need to do something about it. And it is, regardless of ethnicity, overcrowding is wrong. And the other one is jobs and these are low paid jobs and um, they are exposed to other people with very little agency where you can't work from home and again regardless um, um, those jobs we have to um, um, help um, um, to have better protection better control because um, um, obviously these are also very insecure um, um, jobs. So these two, housing and job security, job prospect are two things that I think we have to absolutely um, um, speak up for. Now, what I'm really excited about is, and I think it is genuine that um, um, there is a commitment now, um, and that is a commitment for the council and the partners. So we have our NHS partners here tonight. I'm really thankful to, um, um, to Mohan that we want the type of insights that you have provided to shape and the, the um, emphasis is on shape the council's strategic short, long and um, um, term priorities. Because what in the past has happened, it, it wasn't ill-willed, was that after an inside report like that, it um, ended up in a lot of little projects that had a little bit of funding, that funding then dried up, and then we were more or less back to square one. And we don't want that to happen. I'm absolutely happy projects um, are great and there is a lot of um, energy and ideas about projects, but it needs to be projects that um, are not just sidelined, but help um, um, to shape um, um, the longer term priorities. And in order for that to happen, and Hannah, you have for a long time hold us to account um, to that, because I remember when I started in the council and we worked um, around the community conversations in East Merton, you nudged um, my colleague and um, Andrew Murray to say now, um, Emma, you've taken my time. Um, Emma, can you consider that my time is valuable as you wouldn't question that your time is valuable. And so for me, it is absolutely right to hold us to account 
ongoing funded cork production, yeah, and that is also much more the um, the spirit of we're equal partners. There is not one um, in, 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 that does a favour. Um, um, so that is our commitment and hold us to account on that. And as um, you've heard, I am I'm still really quite um, um, jittery around um, um, the infections um, where we are. So I absolutely need you um, to um, um, keep a lid on them, um, the infection. And um, again, what I thought was so um, inspiring in the report um, it was the push to say, think about us, not as a problem all the time. Think about us, you know, our ingenuity, our strength. And so building on the community assets, um, um, working with you to, for example, um, um, promote the vaccination is one of our most important um, tools. So if you move me on. So um, just in terms of the, um, the shorter term, um, um, you will be aware, um, um, so still um, unfortunately um, sticking to the um, um, COVID agenda, um, we have a local outbreak management plan. It has the ungraceful name LOMP, um, in, but in terms of priorities, we have absolutely um, put the commitment in there because we can pull it up and remind people in case there is slippage. And I'm really delighted that we've um, also um, um, mobilized a bit of money. Um, um, so for the phase two, we want you continue to be around the table and shape how we're coping with this new challenge of the Delta variant and how we're getting over it and recover. And now again, it isn't humongous amount of monies, but I feel it's not completely skimpy either. It's not 16,000, it's 160. So I hope it is understood as what it is. Um, it is a genuine um, um, signal and attempt to say we want you as partners around the table for a recovery that is truly co produced. And um, at the bottom as well, the, um, the Martin Health and Wellbeing Board, you are aware that it is the board that commissioned um, um, this work. And I think it's um, the board as well that um, will take up the challenge that is also loud and clear in your report around East Merton and the, what we call the East Merton model of health and well-being or what other people called the Wilson. We do need to have a health care, health and well-being facility in the East. And it had been on ice. You know, I, since I've been here, I have been pushing this. Um, we got it a little bit up the hill. Then it was on ice again. Um, in, there are lots of green shoots that in, um, more work is happening. Commitment is there. So watch that space and help us to get it over the line. Um, um, so that's um, um, in terms of giving you some examples in terms of more strategic um, um, commitments. If you move me on, I think the last slide, maybe John um, or um, Chris, um, would you want to um, um, possibly talk to this um, um, slide? So I'm happy to talk to this one, Dagmar. Um, just to say a few words about the longer term. Um, and I'm very pleased that um, I'm, that we have the BME Voice report and the way that was done is a, such a good example of asset-based community development and that's what we'd like to see more of um when i'm at the jcc often people uh, say to me well what are you going to do about it and i think that the funding package that uh, dagmar and the team have been able to put together is a very very good start One hundred and sixty-five thousand in the current climate is quite a lot of money uh, but um thinking longer term what we want to do is to take that approach and broaden it out. So there was a lot of work done with community organisations in responding to the, to the pandemic and protecting our communities. What we want to do is to establish a large fund um, across the council and with partners to increase community resilience. Um, through an asset-based approach. So that's taking our strategic partner program and widening it out and focusing it in on kind of community resilience. And 
people said to me, well, small groups lost out through the last funding round and actually groups have cl have closed down. We will have to long term support those community organisations and help help small organisations to grow. They are the lifeblood of communities. So longer term, that, that will follow on in terms of a major funding package to increase resilience. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say is that you're aware that there's a new leader, there's a new cabinet. Um, the cabinet have asked officers and partners to develop a new community-led vision for the borough. There's a the council's embarked on its largest ever engagement program at the moment. I'm very pleased to say that a number, I think 16 small grassroots organizations are assisting us with that. Many of them who, who are here tonight um, and members of BME Voice, which is excellent news. And I've listened very much to what Hannah's had to say about, well, if you're taking my time to tell you something which is of value to you, well, you should fund us for that time. So we are funding those 16 community organisations to do that engagement. But longer term, that will set the priorities for the next four years. Um, so there is a major opportunity to shape what those priorities are. Um, I'm going to put up a website um, web address in a moment but it's a site um which is an interactive it's very easy to use it's a lots of um it's lots of open questions about what are your priorities what do you think the council should be doing in the future what sort of borough do you want to live in both as a place but also as a community um and what i would say to anybody around this room is is fill it in and pass on to others uh, the more people that contribute to that, the more chance that you will have to influence what those priorities are. And that will be that will be going to cabinet in January. Um, and finally, um, we are about to refresh our equality strategy. So that's in line with the new Merton ambition. Uh, we will use the insight report from BME Voice, also the report from MenCap as well and any other community insight to inform that strategy. And many of the recommendations are either in train or I hope that we can develop through the new equality strategy. And you might say, well, you know, why can't you respond to some of these things immediately? But I think it goes back to a point that Dagmar made. If we put it into the equality strategy, it gets into our service plans and for the council, it locks things in for delivery. Um, and long term, I think it is about action and about transparency of whether we have achieved our goals. Uh, I'm just going to put it on the screen. So www.engagingmerton.commonplace. I, I can't quite see, but I think that there's an IS at the end of that. Um, but can, can, we can circulate around that link. But have your say. It, the, there's just a golden opportunity. We've never done anything like this before. So um, we're going to have a community-led vision. So if you want to lead that vision, then take part. Um, Councillor Skeet, I'm going to hand back to you now, I think, uh, for any questions. Thank you, John. Now I'm going to open the floor for questions. Either raise your hand or chat through the, the dialogue box. Quickly, come on. You must have a question, Agatha. No, I'm, trying, I'm trying to behave myself, Max. <laughs> Lakshmi, yeah. did you say something? Yes. I am um, just looking at the, the, the figures here that uh, I noticed that the East Europeans have uh, don't seem to be in that BAME community group. And there are many in uh, Merton who live in poor housing, work in construction and low paid jobs. And I don't really, I wouldn't like to see them forgotten in this, uh, this study and this. So, um, we'll, you know, just to make sure that they are not left out, that's all. Edith. Thank you. I think the report, um, when I mean, I, I, I had to find time to read it, you know, which I have read most of the recommendations and I have um, 
um, looked at it very carefully. I think one of the things that um, um, impressed me so much with this report is the way it was done. Um, it's a very comprehensive report in which younger people were involved, which is important. And mm -hmm. what um, John said just now is, is also important that the recommendations will be on the um, um, equality refresh program, which I think is quite good because we, we, we've had several, several reports over the years, you know, if I could remember one of the recommendations we had, you know, was the uh, McPherson's report, which um, obviously we, we, you know, although we took a, f a few of the actions seriously, but I felt that some of them were just left in the cupboard, covered in dust, and we did not Im implement a few of them. But I think time has passed and it, it appears now we've moved on from what we used to do. And I think this is so important because of, um, um, of, of COVID. COVID has changed all of our lives. And I'm delighted to see Martin is taking um, a, first, a forefront from other boroughs because I've looked at what other boroughs have done. And I think we are leading in terms of what we're doing, you know, because we just cannot be left, you know, to stay behind. We see what's happening. I was at a meeting um, the other day where I was talking to Ma 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 Marcus Rashford, not because I'm a Manchester United supporter. I, I, I just happened to be at a meeting talking about his book, which um, as you can all see on the television has refreshed and engaged a lot of young kids. And this is what we have to do. So I am delighted that um, a lot of younger people were interviewed because take for example, we look at our criminal justice system. You know, we have a big problem where ethnic minority um, people are not there to represent, you know, the judiciary. And we are having difficulties in terms of how to get, you know, people from, you know, ethnic background to sort of deliver the law in terms of fairness and equality. So I think this is a starting point and I think we're gonna move ahead. I'm very pleased to hear what John Dimas said. It has to be refreshed in the equality strategy. And I think we'll have to monitor most of the recommendations from time to time. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Agatha? Um. <laughs> thank you, Marcy. Um, thank you, uh, Hannah, for the reports and everything. It's a good report, and I know you work hard. I would say I saw you doing all the hard work with everybody else. I think it's great. I think it's a good idea that it's going to be added on to the counter the equality thing, um, pay strategy. But I just hope that it's not going to be just added to the council equality and strategy. Yeah and things are going to be done with it. Also, uh, I think Dagmar said something, was it Dagmar or John? One of them said about the 16 um, community groups who are involved and they are going to be used and I think they're going to be financed to do some of the work, which is wonderful. But let's hope that they're going to be financed to do the work and they'll be continually supported to do the work and not just be dangled a carrot because we've been there before. And I'm very plain speaking. If that's what's going to happen, then it shouldn't happen because otherwise you pick people up and you drop them. They do all the work. They're not um, thanked for the work they do. They try and fix put them all together because there's too many pe people doing the same sort of thing. And they end up suffering for it. So if we're actually going to do this, let's do it properly. Because you know, if you're going to have the BME community, and the minority. Let's do it properly. Let's just not be ticking boxes or giving them little dangles of carrot so it sounds good because we you know we're doing a good job. That's why I say I'm trying to be I'm trying to behave myself. You know how I feel about these things. So I mean let's do it right. Let's do it right. Because I was initially very angry when they kept saying the BME community are the ones who were most likely to get it. And people were telling me they felt that people were picking on them, that they are the ones spreading the disease. And it wasn't that way, it wasn't, it wasn't this, it was the same proportional represent as everybody else would, but it was going around like, you know, they felt that they were the plague. 
Yeah. So I'm glad that you know that's come out in this in this report, and people feel that they're normal. They're not the ones spreading, the, you know, the disease or something mm -hmm. like that. So well done, Hannah. Well done, you know, all of you for doing it. But if we're doing it, please, 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 let's do it properly. Thank you. Okay, I got to thank you. Anyone else? Good evening, Chair. It's Bo um, from Merton Connected. I'd just like to ask a question, if possible. Yeah, go on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Hannah and uh, BAME Voice for preparing such a comprehensive and um, well-researched report. I just wanted to ask whether um, amongst your respondents, um, the percentage, if, if you know, of people who had no recourse to public funds um, within the community. Because I know that, for example, we recently conducted a small piece of research into 75 households receiving food parcels. The number of um, individuals where there was no recourse to public funds that affected their ability um, to um, be economically um, resilient um, was fortunately high. So I just wondered whether um, there were or whether um, you identified people with no recourse to public funds in your um, research? Yes, um, there were uh, quite, quite a number of people who didn't have recourse to, um, to funding. Um, as you know, there's certain uh, a situation in terms of the immigration status um, that you know, doesn't allow you to work, it doesn't allow you to have access to um, to any uh, money from, from, from the government. And I think the um, Tamil community were particularly affected um, by this. But what happened was that the food banks and the clothes banks that um, sprung up all over the place was a lifeline to a whole lot of people. I know the Power Center Church in Mitcham, you know, it has hundreds of people just lining up to, to, to get food. So yes, it, it, I can't tell you the exact percentage of people who had no recourse to, to public funding, but certainly there, there would be because there are so many people who have uh, difficulties and who have not had their immigration status um, corrected. So they would fall into that bracket. Thank you. I just think um, the no recall to public funds is a, a particular specific of any communities that isn't affecting a number of other communities. And it's a layer on top of a number of other issues that sometimes need to be taken into account. If I can add, we have a lift the ban process, which is going to be implemented soon but the, the leader Mr. Nick Koch he was ill so we postpone it to September. In the lift the ban we will try to get we are implementing a process where when you get into this asylum seekers thing you have six months before your case can be heard no more than six months because it's impacting us as a community. So we say we are saying we give you six months. If you, your case is hard or you're not hard, then we will see some significant changes. But we give you six months, not like myself. I waited eight years. You know, and I'm a mental health. I could have been a mad woman by now. But thank God, when this is implemented, we hope that things will change. Thank Sorry, you. Chair, if I could just interject, the lift the ban report is going to cabinet and that's to get the council to join the coalition to, as you said, support um, enabling asylum seekers to, to work. Um, the other event that you were alluding, alluding to was linked to the work that Merton Citizens have been doing around refugees. They were going to have an event in Refugee Week, but it's now been postponed to September. But certainly the, the, the leader and the current administration are wanting to get behind the Lift the Bank Coalition. Thank you, Everett. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I, 
Uh, hi, Marcy. It's, it's Mohan here. I've, I've put my hand up, but I, I don't know whether you've, whether you've seen it. Hi, but... Mohan. I couldn't see you, but go ahead. That's all right. I, I just got a couple of things to say. Thanks, um, Hannah, um, for the report, Dame Voice, and also Dagmar as well. Um, and, and I agree with Dagmar. The second time around, it actually is better. better it's, it's, it's even better reading as well because you have more time to uh, absorb it. And, and I, I, it really does highlight some of the issues which we kind of know or, 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 or potentially thought about, but actually you've got it there and some real good evidence um, to which we can then really um, target and tackle. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, well, one comment I wanted to say and also a question um, around the health bit. So as we now have population um, health and primary care networks, certainly in Eastern Burton, there's two networks and, and practices are working in, in, in groups of, of, of bigger size population so they can really address the needs of our local community and so this report will really help in terms of engaging with with health and um, to be able to then target those areas which need that support um, which then leads on to my second question was about the, the bit about relationship with health um, and how we that there needs to be a better sort of relationship or understanding with with health and I kind of wanted to extrapolate that a bit more and find out what that might mean um, and, and I'll give you my sort of thoughts. It, so for me, I think a lot of, um, with, with due to social terms of health, a lot of issues are down to social issues, um, which may not necessarily be health related. Um, and therefore, if we can help support those or address those, we might be able to then address the health issues as well. I think it's twofold as well. I think it's addressing the, the social problems and also the, um, the medical problems as well, working hand in hand. But I think without solving the social issues, patients won't be ready for looking at their medical concerns. So I wanted to ask a bit, a bit around that, how we might be able to improve the health um, relationship uh, in particular. Thanks. F Fitzroy? Yeah, th thank you um, very much, Marcy. Um, I'll just like, just like to really um, congratulate and celebrate the report. Um, it surpassed my expectations and I'm well pleased and very proud of the BAME organization for pulling this together and working um, with all the community. And it's a very robust an in-depth report. And I love the way that Anna said that it wasn't their views, it was the views of the people in the Borough of Merton highlighting all the challenges they're experiencing. I just wanted to just acknowledge something that touched me in the report was the kind of approach in relation to whilst acknowledging the existence of racism and condemning it, it in it, all its forms, I'm just wondering how going forward the bar is going to deal with that issue amongst our community and will the funding and support will assist to deal with that. And so we can go forward and we'll say the report has highlighted and we've been able to use a report in the development of the new equality strategy to change and to balance out what the report has highlighted. We don't want to be seen as complaining or moaning or always needing. We have skills and ability to add and support the borough we're in. And I think that is a, my question in, in, in a kind of a nutshell going forward. How will this be addressed? Thank you. Anna, would you like to answer? Well, I think the second question, um, Roy, that would go to um, possibly uh, John Dimmer. Um, the, the, um, the first question, um, I wonder whether perhaps, it, I think Mohan, it would take some time. And Edward um, here is an expert in these matters. And I wondered whether we could put him in touch with you after this, this you know, because this would take some time to discuss, obviously. The question that you've you've asked, and uh, um, sorry, I'm not trying to get out of this, but I think it's it's more a question for the council, isn't it? Don't you think? Correct. Yes. It wasn't so, addressed to the BAME community. I was celebrated what you've achieved and accomplished, and the BAME community have actually highlighted 
the fact of um, the existence of racism and acknowledge that this isn't a time to focus on that because that would skew it, the report, which is so wonderfully put together. And I thoroughly enjoy reading it. Thank you. Can I just ha have a stab at answering that, Fitzroy? Because I think it's very interesting. I think when we were originally looking at this piece of work, um, I think what was very powerful in terms of what 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 Hannah suggested was that, that actually the piece of work should be community led and it should be communities uh, talking amongst themselves and supporting one another. And it should be the council supporting those communities to take that community led approach. And I think that has paid off both in terms of the results in the the report, in terms of its findings, but also in the fact it, it, it is in itself a strength and resilience. And I suppose that's what I was trying to make the point about the transforming how we work with communities piece of work is that that is, is a strength based approach. So looking to build on the assets um, within communities and to provide some long term sustainable funding for how we do that. And, uh, and I think that 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 celebrates the, the diversity of Merton's communities it, its its inclusiveness and is a way to tackle inequality. Uh, and, and that's that's a community led approach. That's an asset based approach. So that's what we're trying to swing behind um, in the longer term. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Any other any other questions? Uh, uh, sorry, my name is Grace Oyerinde. Um, just uh, can I just say, moving on from what John Dimmer has just raised, first of all, again, I'd like to commend Hannah on the excellent reports. She's addressed so many excellent points, points that are really on the heart of you know, people within the community, not just black, but white, the whole community. We are all aware of these issues. Um, John, you talked about um, the community leading. And yes, the community should lead in many respects. And the community has actually um, led in terms of supporting Hannah to put this report together. However, the power does not lie with the community per se, but with the community leaders. So I, I, my concern with this report, again, there's been so many reports, the Sewer report, Stephen Lawrence report, McPherson report, and countless others. They are reports. So the, the question, I mean, really needs to be asked and really addressed is, who is going to support in really bringing some of these um, issues that have been raised to actually get it across the line? Who is actually going to be involved with taking this report and driving it and liaisoning alongside the community to make sure it's not just another report? So that's my first point. And I, 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 this is something that we cannot just gloss over. This is really, you know, we've seen decade after decade that change has never actually come. It's just reports that keep coming. Um, but my other point in Hannah's report, this is a question to Hannah. Um, you've addressed the issue of black authentic history being taught within the school system. And I totally agree that, you know, it's time that, you know, particularly within Merton where you've uh, uh, raised the fact that almost 40% of its community is of black ethnic BAME community. It is time that we are teaching our young people their history, building up their sense of self-worth, their identity, their confidence. You know, how do we make sure, again, that change does come within the curriculum, change does come within our school history uh, um, system? Thank you. Thank you. Anna? Yes, sure, Grace. Um, I think one of the good things about um, what we've heard today from the council is that there is that recognition that um, some of the recommendations, if not all of the recommendations, need to be tangible, need, need meat to them. And I think the council, John and Dagma, have given us quite a bit of hope that there will be meat added to it. 
For example, you are in education yourself and you're in that area of teaching black history to black children. Now, what um, Dagmar was saying, I think John was saying, was that there's a pot of money that's going to be allocated to various organizations to carry out certain pieces of work. Okay, so some of it would be health, but obviously some of it could be channeled to the work that you, for example, are doing. So that um, the, the broader point about the history of black people within Merton, within this country, is, um, is projected and that people know about it. I think it's because people don't know about, the, 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 for example, the black people have been here since Tudor times. These are the things that you, Grace, must now come forward with. You push this agenda. Do you see what I mean? Don't just wait for the council. You mm -hmm. drive it through. Thank you. I would try. I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we move to Slavic? Well, see, there's um, Chris after Slavic, yeah? Yeah, no, I know, I know. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, also, first of all, thank you to Hannah for, uh, for the report. Uh, um, it's an excellent piece of work, and uh, hopefully it will be taken forward. Uh, I will echo comments, uh, or Lakshmi comment, actually, uh, about the Eastern Europeans. Uh, with um, the different descriptions of the BAME groups uh, across the country, how do we will make sure that Eastern Europeans are part of the community-led approach? Anyone? Who, want, who wants to answer that? I think that's a question for you, John, isn't it? I think what I would say is that I think, as is, is you know, some of the, in terms of some of the short term response to COVID, we, we will be looking to work with the East European communities in terms of some of the issues which have been identified in the BME Voice report are exactly the same for East European communities linked to overcrowding, linked to jobs. And uh, so that the funding from the Outbreak Management Control Plan will um, assist in in tackling some of the issues in terms of um, kind of low take up testing, that kind of vaccination with those communities as well. And I, I would also say that, um, as, as you know, Starvek, the transforming, the, again, I'm sorry to sound kind of like a broken record, but we've learned a lot of lessons from the previous kind of round of kind of strategic partner funding. And I'm delighted to say that we fund um, the Association of kind of Polish Families for the first time and you will know that we're carrying out an extensive engagement at the moment on looking at our strategic partner program going forward so that's the package of funding that will be linked to, to kind of community resilience and those we, we will be particularly looking at, at those kind of communities who ha, are disproportionately affected by covid so that will include the east european communities as well so i think that's my answer on that i don't know if anybody else got anything to add on that can I just um, very quickly um, simply say, um, Slavek, a big thank you that you're sticking it out as well and you are sitting around the same table like Hannah, like Grace, with your knowledge, with your understanding and hold us to account, keep holding us to account and keep coming to the table. And um, we are absolutely um, um, trying um, the reciprocity that we've um, said core production needs to be um, um, remunerated and we stick that out and we rely on you that you stick it out with us. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can we move on to Chris Lee? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Chair. So firstly, just to, to explain who I am and why I'm here. This is my first time at the JCC meeting. Uh, and whilst I'm one of the council's directors, the main reason I'm here is because I now chair the the Council's Equality Steering Group, which is our council uh, officer group to look at equalities issues both within and outside the council. Uh, and I've really um, found the debate very, very helpful for me. I've read the report some time back, and indeed it came to our Equality Steering Group earlier this week. The reason I wanted to just say a few words was just to, I suppose, pick up on 
Fitzroy's point around how will the council take this forward? How will we deal with the systemic deep-seated inequality and racism? Uh, and I wanted to provide some reassurance. And I suppose that reassurance is about the fact that, that there won't be long lasting change unless we root this within the council's policies and funding. And it has to be led into our business plans and our service plans. And the timing is very helpful in that sense because not only are we conducting the largest engagement exercise, which will lead into next year's business planning process and the budgets that go alongside that, but we also have this report and the MENCAP report and the Age Merton report, which will help us to ensure that the policies and the service plans that the council adopts seek to address the issues that are raised. Many of these issues aren't new, I accept that wholly, uh, but at least there will be a greater opportunity for us to be able to make sure that the money sits alongside the actions, because without that, there won't be the deep-seated, long-lasting change that's needed. So I wanted to provide that reassurance, and I sit on corporate management team, uh, and with the Equality Steering Group, we will be, and are already working to ensure that this report is understood by each departmental management team so that the findings, wherever they sit in terms of responsibilities, can be weaved into the actions that we will develop in order to get that deep-seated change. Thank you, Chair. You're on mute, Marcy. You're muted. Sorry. I would like to say congratulations on the report, Hannah, which was very, 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 it was very precise and hard work went into it. And I must congratulate you for the work you've done. Thank you and keep up the good work. I would like to move on now to item number five, human resources update from Liz Hammond. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm going to attempt to share my screen with you. If you can just bear with me for just a moment. So you're seeing a report, Annual Inequality Employment Report 2021 slide. The screen is blank. The screen's blank. Mm. Have you got this report in your packs? Yes, we have, Liz. Yes, we have. So if you if you could, um, uh, actually, I'll try this one just to see if this works. Yeah, we can see the slide deck, That's Liz. That's better. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if I can get it to go from the beginning. Okay, if you can see that, then hopefully this is going to work. Um, okay, so there's a number of things I want to talk to you about this evening, one of which is our uh, first full annual equalities and employment report, which was just being produced and was taken to CMT a couple of weeks ago. And also, um, some of you may be aware that we recently did a staff engagement survey. And um, what I want to share with you is the results um, from a, from a BAME perspective. Um, so the, um, the the questions have been broken down. Um, I'll talk a bit about more about when we, when we get to that one. So this, this report, which is a new report, will be produced in, in May each year. It follows the standards of the REST framework. And now for those of you that are unfamiliar with that, Merton have recently become a pilot of the REST framework, which is an NHS social care um, uh, uh, sort of um, initiative looking at equality standards and, and what we can do to improve them. So um, 
we're following that, but we're taking the approach where not only will we work with the res to produce the stats that they're looking for from a BAME perspective, but we will also take this um, across the whole council and across all protected characteristics. So the res data um, will be produced in September and then annually each year um, in April. And um, this, this particular report will be, um, now it's been produced and agreed by CMT will be um, produced and published internally and also externally on the Merton web pages. And, and what it attempts to do is to look at equalities and protected characteristics across a range of indicators. So top 5% of earners, recruitment, turnover and stability, promotions, um, uh, formal stages of sickness capability, disciplinary grievances, employment tribunals, and participation in learning and development. So the results I've, I've brought you tonight are, are, are really just focusing from the BAME perspective, but also, as I said, the report does actually go across all uh, protected characteristics. What we are seeing is that the percentage of BAME um, staff in the organisation continues to increase. Um, in the last four years, it has increased by 6%. However, we are very, very conscious that we do currently not have any staff with a salary over 80K. So BAME staff therefore constitute a low proportion of the top 5% of earners. Um, BAME staff are less likely to remain over time than their white colleagues. So when we look at a stability um, index, what we do see actually is that once you get to one year, two year, three year, four year, five years of service, that that drops. It drops, it drops for everyone. Um, obviously, you're more likely to move on from an organisation in your third year or your fifth year than you are in your first year. But it's slightly higher for BAME staff than it is for white. Um, BAME staff are as likely to be promoted as white staff, so there's no difference in, in, um, in the indicators in terms of, of those that are promoted. Um, there are a low number of cases overall of um, formal cases, but capability are 57%, disciplinary 50%, grievance 44% compared to the workforce profile of 22% of black staff. So whilst it's not necessarily a difference in terms of BAME as a, as a total group, there is a, a higher percentage than the workforce profile of black staff that are going through formal casework. Um, BAME staff have a higher attendance at learning and development events than white staff. So there is, um, a, you know, the BAME staff are very active in, in putting themselves forward for learning and development and there's no barrier to them to doing that. So these are, are some of the, the sort of the key headlines from the report. And I'm sure if you've gone through the report itself, um, you'll have seen that there's a wealth of statistics there um, for you to absorb. In the staff engagement survey, so this report that we're bringing to you today looks at indicators where there's a 10% or more variance, either positive or negative. And um, when you actually drill down even further and you look at a 5% or a 3% or a 1% variance, um, what, we, what we've found is that BAME staff that participated in the survey have a more favorable perspective of the organization than we might have thought from antidotal evidence. Um, so that some of the key headlines here are that BAME staff are less likely to consider that the council treats employees equally across several of the protected characteristics. That wasn't just race. Um, BAME staff are more likely to report bullying or harassment due to race or gender. And BAME staff were more positive in the survey about induction, developing new skills and about organisational change than their white colleagues. Now, this information in its um, entirety, i.e. the full reports, um, went to CMT um, a couple of weeks ago. And so I thought it'd be useful just to sort of, um, uh, sort of highlight here some of the key decisions that CMT have made. So they um, approved the annual equalities report 
to be published both internally and externally. It's been shared with the unions, it's been shared with the REN group um, internally, and um, uh, obviously it will be published as, as we've outlined. They asked that the results were specifically shared with the REN group and the unions. Now, interestingly, I met with the REN chairs um, this week and they had some interesting feedback, which I'll come back to in a moment. All these documents, um, as Chris has just said, have been to the Equality Steering Board this week um, with a view to putting in place an action plan, which CMT will then approve. So what we've agreed is that um, the uh, information, its entirety will go to the um, four DMTs, uh, which is the departmental management teams. They will look at the data and then the departmental leads will come back and meet with me in a few weeks time to bring back their thinking about the information that's contained in those reports, what it's saying to them and what actions we, we should be doing internally in the organisation. I'm also having um, a session with the whole of the REN group looking at these figures in a few weeks time as well. Um, CMT had agreed last year that HR policies, um, which we obviously review um, on, a, on a regular basis anyway, should be um, looked at in a priority order um, and, and in particular, that priority would be looking at those, those policies that could most affect um, staff in terms of action being taken. So that would be things like recruitment and selection, um, uh, you know, the uh, inner grievance and, and the um, capability policies, for example. So we've, we've, we've started that review and um, we've worked with the unions and the REN group to um, go through the recruitment and selection policy procedure and guidance. That has been, um, the feedback has been taken on board and those policies have been changed and they have been um, agreed by CMT. And we also um, have reviewed the, um, the policy on our equalities policy itself and that's been reviewed and CMT have agreed that the next policies that we're, we're reviewing is probation and the reorganisation policy. Um, CMT have approved BAME presence on all senior appointments. That was put in place last year. Um, and but CMT also um, have now agreed, based on some of the analysis contained in the CMT report, that we should try and bring together a pool of willing BAME volunteers for all recruitment panels. Um, but this would be very much subject to getting sufficient volunteers. Now we run about 250 panels a year. So we would need a pool of about 30 to 40 willing volunteers in order to support those panels so that people don't feel overwhelmed. And also it's really important that anyone participating in recruitment panels can be a decision maker in their own right and actually have an affinity with the role that they're supporting. Now I met with the um, REN chairs um, this week and they had some interesting feedback on this particular action because when they looked at the data their thoughts were that actually we don't have a problem in recruiting uh, BAME staff up to 50k so therefore why are we focusing on those recruitment panels and that actually if we're going to focus our attention anywhere it should be on appointments above 50k. What you're not seeing in this data, and um, I alluded to the other protected characteristics, is that actually when you look at the feedback from the staff survey, um, whilst BAME staff were generally quite positive in the survey, our disabled staff were not. And there's clearly some further work that we need to be doing with our disabled staff. And of course, not forgetting that some of our disabled staff could also be BAME staff. So um, I'm going to support um, the setting up of an ability net. So very like the REN group, um, a, a staff group for disabled employees. It would be run by them once we get it up and going, but for me to sort of support them to, to encourage that group to come together. And I'm also going to undertake some um, specific focus groups with disabled staff in order to try and get further um, detail from an operation level of why staff disabled staff are feeling the way they are. One of the um, actions that has been um, under discussion for quite a while now is um, the potential introduction of the Rooney Rule. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with the Rooney Rule, um, this is where 
And it, it came from American football, where they made a commitment that all recruitment panels um, in the final selection of candidates would have a female and a BAME person. And if you haven't got that, then the recruitment can't proceed. So we've been analysing our data, looking at um, all the um, recruitment panels that we've held, um, the um, ethnicity of all the candidates. Now, here we have to remember that not everybody declares, and we do have um, an issue internally, um, like most organisations, where we have a high percentage of staff who do not declare their protected characteristics. And despite as much encouragement as we can give people um, and assurances as to why the data would be used, um, some people do withhold that data and it's not mandatory, we can't make them do it. So there is, to some degree, even a gap in terms of our own internal intelligence. So with the Rooney Rule, um, we've monitored this data and we've looked at it and we've, um, for, for the moment, CMT have decided not to implement the Rooney Rule, um, but to keep a watching brief on any organisations that, that are and to look at what benefits it may or may not bring to those organisations. One of the significant drawbacks um, of this is that you can get to your final shortlist, you can get to the final stage, and if you haven't got a main candidate, you've got to go back to the drawing board and you've got to start again. Or even worse than that, a recruiting manager might be tempted to put through a BAME candidate into the final shortlist just so that the recruitment that could continue um, without that candidate really having much chance of being a successful candidate, which would be um, a terrible thing to do. So uh, for those reasons, um, as I say, we've decided not to introduce it at the moment, but keep um, a watching brief. Um, I can um, talk about some, you know, we have had five senior recruitments um, this year, which is very, very unusual. We can go years without doing any um, AD, director um, and chief exec appointments. Some of you will be quite familiar with some of the, the um, some of those appointments. And I can confirm that we have had BAME candidates in the final shortlist, um, um, but the last three appointments um, have gone to internal candidates. Um, um, not external. And we've got two assistant director appointments out at the moment. Um, and we're only at the selection of the long list at the moment. So we're still a way off from getting to final panel interviews. But what I can tell you is that for one post, we've got um, the, we've got 13 um, applicants in the long list. 62% uh, are white and 38% are BAME. And in the other post, we've got a long list of 10 where 40% are white and 60% are BAME. Now, obviously those recruitments still have some way to go to completion, um, but that's kind of where we are with senior recruitment, which I know has been a particular concern of this group. Um, I'll stop there and uh, open to questions. Thank you, Liz. Any questions for Liz? I, I, I just got her, her, her hand up, but I do have questions since I'm off mute. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, the intent to start unconscious bias training, I know it's been quite topical in the media recently uh, where some say it's a you know a good thing others think it's not such a good thing but we talked at this uh, committee a year ago about the introduction of unconscious bias training and it was something that um, Liz I think you and your colleagues spoke quite positively about rolling out is that something that's still in process is that yes it is but actually ironically the reason it's been um slightly held up is um really with engagement with our own group so um we engage with them about the training we put them um through the training and we talk to them about um about their you know their feedback and and, and their feelings about it and um, I, I think, you know, not that they were not supportive of that particular training, um, but what they felt was 
it wasn't sufficient in its entirety um, and that we should be looking at a wider sort of um, approach to how we tackle this whole issue of ensuring that people have a and have a you know real understanding of um, BAME issues um, and how to engage and, and interact with people in the most positive way so that we're not unconsciously you know being biased so the training is being rolled out but but just to say really it's not it's not going to be the be all and end all, and end all. so you know like you I have heard both positive and negative feedback about um, unconscious bias training um, because most most of those courses actually they're they're quite generic in the sense of they they look at unconscious bias in its entirety not just from a race perspective so that was the concern of the REN group that or whilst it was a useful tool it, it shouldn't be the only tool thank you Liz Agatha thank you Liz thanks for your report did you say that being um, staff were more likely to say that the the that their work was supportive and they were always had more or less saying positive things about their work. Because I'm wondering whether, are they just saying that because they don't want to lose their job or they actually mean it? No, no, sorry, well, that's not what I said, no. I was talking about, um, the first point was that BAME staff were less likely to promote Merton as an organisation. Okay, they're less likely to promote Merton as an organisation. Yeah. Yes, that's that's the way I I've understood it. So I just I just thought you were saying the opposite, and and you say they're more likely to be disciplinary and grievance cases and culpability. Yeah, we, have we have we looked into why these situations are around and seem to affect the Bay community more? Because you know we're trying to improve things, and if we don't find out what's going on, we won't we basically won't get anywhere. You know, when you get when you get the community, people complaining all the time, because I get in my ear complaining all the time about stuff that's going on and how, you know, they don't feel that they're supported or, you know, work wise, they don't feel that, you know, that they're part of the uh, workforce or whether they're actually being appreciated for what they've done and they're not really getting on promotion wise. You need to find and if anything happens they're the ones to sort of get blamed for it. So I think we need to find out what, you know, what's happening and how it's happening. Mm. When so, it gets to a stage, I can only I can only reassure people to a certain level. I can't reassure, reassure them for what's happening. I can only support the council to a certain level. But I think when things are, that are happening, we have to really find out what's happening, why it's happening, and why do they feel that it's just, I mean, the statistics say it's more, more of the BME, the Black, you know, the British staff that sort of feature in these things. Yeah. So, so our our current casework really boiled down to two particular pockets of staff and two different, very different issues. One one was due to a restructure um, where the, there was a quite high percentage of BAME staff in that particular team, um, and that has generated. A lot of grievances and employment tribunals from that particular restructure and the other issue was an issue um, concerning um, uh, really related to COVID in a way um, from a group of staff that were affected by by COVID in, in the terms of their work and their feelings around how that was affecting them um, because of COVID, so it was a, it was a COVID related issue. Those those really are the two reasons for our casework at the moment. So, in answer to your question, I I, I do know why um, we've got those 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 issues, and and they are related to two specific things. So they're not they're not general um, dissatisfaction. Um, they have, they do have a common thread. Okay. Can I? Can I ask a question? I've got my hands up. Is Fitzroy? Go on, Fitzroy. Um, Liz, um, thank you very much for that. I, I, I read through and looked looked over it, and it was well um, documented and a lot of information there. Just just a, a question in in the context of historically, 
has there been um, any BAME staff that earned over 80K uh, within the council? I've been here 20 years and I find it quite a um, uh, challenge um, to be in a council where there are not any BAME staff that earns over 80K. I wonder what underlining a kind of currency that's suggesting in relation to the overall staffing structure, mm -hmm. HR structure of the borough. So I've not been here very long and I'm just wondering whether I can um, enlist the support of Chris um, as to whether he's got um, any recollection historically um, of, of BAME staff over 80K. So you, you'd be looking at sort of head of service and above. Yeah, from, from memory there have been. Um, certainly Abdul Kara, who was Assistant Chief Executive, probably about, it's, it, it must be 10, 11 years ago now, there was certainly over 80k. Um, and I'm having to trawl my memory for some of the other departments in terms of ADs and above. Um, head of, so I mean, the Head of Community Safety is is close to that. Uh, he's currently a, a, a black member of staff and black woman in my department. Um, but uh, yes, I'm sure, to answer your question, Fitzroy, yes, absolutely, there have been, um, but there aren't any at the present time. Thank, thank you very much for that, Chris. It's, it's just, it, it's, it's um, because of the, the, the reports over the years and seeing that the growth in the BAME community within the borough, uh, it, it would be um, relevant, especially for education and younger people within um, the borough that like to see somebody that reflects themselves in that type of position. Because sometimes what it's seen is that we can get the lower paid jobs, but unlikely to get the higher paid jobs. And that is a, a cultural kind of issue that we sometimes face in the BAME community and disproportionately has affected us in, in, in many ways, not because they are not BAME individuals with the skills and the talents. Um, so I'm just wondering why it, they don't seem to be growing within Merton as, as I thought it would be. That's just my um, assessment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Hannah. Yes, thank you, Liz. I just wondered, one of the workshops we held with um, BAME staff from the council, there was a suggestion that people were not very happy um, with the way that uh, they were being treated. Um, so I think, I think that was what probably Councillor Agatha was referring to. Um, and there was thought that there was going to be a group, a supervision kind of group um, that would be uh, a support group that would help um, members of staff. Can you tell us whether this has been set up and what progress has been made? I'm just, I'm just wondering in what context this might be. Um, and whether, we're wondering whether you're actually talking about the REN group itself or something else. I don't know, but what it was that there was going to be a support group because um, the members felt that they needed somewhere to go, that they could talk, they could exchange ideas. Um, I, and there was going to be, that was going to be set up. So I don't know what it was called, but is there such a group at the moment at the council for the AME and workers? I mean, there is a lot of support, but support for all staff in various guises. I, 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 I don't, I'm not aware of a specific support group for, for BAME staff in the way you've described it. So it's just possible that it hasn't been formed yet? It's not something that has come I, I, I'm just wondering where this originated from because it's not something that has come to me described in the way you've described it. Can I just chip in because I honestly think it's the Race Equality Network. It was first called the, the BAME Network and it has been around for a while and it has been set up and it is led by um, and BAME staff, Hannah. So I think it's, it's fair that we double check, but I'm 
um, um, positive, that that's what it refers to, and quite a big progress has been made. So I don't want to leave the group hanging, um, thinking nothing has happened, because we're actually quite proud this has moved on considerably, and they are um, um, uh, really one of those assets that the local authority has got now. Yes, and they Chris, do, they is do that your understanding? They, they do have a significant... That's absolutely my understanding, yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much for everyone that contributed. Now we move on to item number six, community engagement by Superintendent Roger Arditi. Sorry, Councillor Skeet. Um, unfortunately, um, Roger D. Arditi is ill. He was taken ill suddenly. So that was the apology given at the start of the meeting. It's okay. highly unusual and sorry about that. Well, apologies to, to the group <laughs> on yeah. his behalf. Yeah, I do apologize. Can we move on to any other business? Mm, this is a good meeting, no other business. <laughs> Actually, sorry, I, I do have one. Just to okay. say that I will bring in um, a, like a high level draft of the quality strategy to the next meeting. As you've heard throughout the meeting, there are numerous strands of work going on uh, and the various reports that have, the impact reports that have been done, I'm going to be using that to structure our priorities and focus. And I'm, I'm keen to hear um, what you think needs to be priorities. I mean, if any of you have any specific thoughts, I'm happy to take those um via email and that will get considered uh, and weaved into the the strategy as we take it forward but a lot of the work that is going on now will inform the strategy thank you everett agatha um yeah mohan i just want to ask mohan because you said something about how can you help the the bain and ethnic minority community to, to talk about their health or something like that um, yeah, it was one of the reports, wasn't it? It was, it was improved the relationship between um, uh, health um, and BME communities. <clears throat> and and what, what? Does that, what does that mean? How we can do that? I just have sort of one thing or a couple of things to say is basically listen to them. Because the problem is that people feel that the doctors don't listen. Because, you know, when you go in, I'm not saying you, because, you know, you've got a good name, but what they feel that you go in, you've got five or 10 minutes to go and say what you what what ailments you've got. Or if you've got two ailments, you've got to rebook and whatever you've got, they're yeah. telling you, they just feel the doctors don't listen because they say as soon as they're there, they're on their computer writing out prescriptions or something. So it basically, if you want to, you know, the community to you sort of get to communicate with them and to be to listen to you, you've got to listen to them. If somebody comes in with an ailment or whatever, you, you know, they want to tell you something. So what you find is a lot of people aren't going to the GPs or doctors that, at all at the moment, because they don't, they don't think they, they want to know and they're scared, you know, they want to go there. So that basically listen to them. Yeah, and, and, and I think, yeah, and obviously a lot of practitioners are, are doing that or trying to do that, or maybe the perception is not, not the case. I'm not sure that's particularly Bain specific though. I no, no, it's, no, it's not based specific, but at the so, moment so, you're so, asking. So, so, so I think that's in a 10 minute consultation, it is tricky. But you're, you're asking about them, and this is what they mean. I mean, most some others will come. Then, then being so, so for me, a, a suggestion for me, you know, for communities is actually um, how do, do we need to outreach in communities? Do we need to understand? Do we need to build a trust as opposed to a 10 minute consultation right in front of you? Uh, or is it um, some, something else which needs to? to develop i mean i think the actual 10 minute sort of consultation is is you know that's a whole new new sort of issue in its own right but i think Which, which, whichever way you do it the basic thing is you've got to listen to them yeah of course. somebody might come with some fear with something you know they feel they're not being listened to or the doctors don't want to know you've got to listen to them. that's all i can say this is what i can pass back okay you know, thank you've, you. got, you know, you've got to listen to people Okay, no, no, it's certainly taken on board, and I think certainly in the by and large, everyone is trying to do, to do that particular thing. So yeah, 
Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Agatha. Now we move to Grace. Yeah, so I there's two items that I would love to see on the next JCC uh, agenda, and um, which would be the follow up to the excellent um, ethnic minorities report uh, that Hannah has worked so hard with her team to put together is like the next steps. You know, I, I want to see a working document, something, you know, an outline of where do we go from here? Yeah. So it'd be really good to have somebody come and share with us where we go from here. What are the next steps? Uh, that was the first thing. And there was another thing I wanted to oh, go back to. Um, I've forgotten a lovely lady from the council who deals with HR, um, where she talk, talked about the unconscious bias and the hesitancy. Really would be good to know what has happened so far in terms of statistics. Have you started to roll out the unconscious bias training? And you know, maybe a brief update of how that's looking and how you're proceeding with that. Thank that's you. It. Thank you. Anyone else? I've got my hands up, if possible, just one last question. Is that Fitzroy? It is, yes. Go on, Fitzroy. Um, I'm going back to the report um, that I celebrated and, you know, I mean, I'm definitely going to read it over and over again to use it in my own needs of um, functioning, but to use a better word, function within the borough. Um, I wonder how one individual that has experienced um, racism, where do they bring their voice to whom to assist them to deal with that challenge. The reason I've raised that, I am personally dealing with a case myself of racism I, I experience, and it's not pointed at the borough, so please don't <laughs> think that at all. Um, and I, it's happened in the borough, but I, I just have not don't feel who I could bring and raise that issue to and what support one could get. And if I'm a CEO that's been in the borough for 20 years and have a lot of contact and networks, if I find that I'm not sure who to actually bring that challenge and that issue to, how would a member of the community who experience racism, but whatever age or whatever BAME culture they may be, who is there, would there be signposts to? That, that is my question. Thank you. Now, who can answer that, John? I'm not sure if John's still on the call. Um, that's, that's a difficult question I mean we don't have our, we don't have a, a race relation council in, in the borough I mean it, it, it would depend very much who it is I mean if it's one of the statutory agencies then I, I think the thing to do would be to speak to someone very senior but but Fitzroy that is a really really pertinent question that you've raised obviously if it's difficult because racism is hard to prove often. So again, mm. you have the law to protect you, but it's about getting the evidence. And in terms of the support networks, um, there aren't, we don't have many because internally the staff at, at Merton now have the race equality network as a, a way of um, people just supporting one another, but there isn't any formal structure. I mean, you if you worked in the borough, you could get access to the employee assistance scheme, for instance. But I, I think that is a very difficult question because there's nothing like that. I mean, Kingston have a race equality council and perhaps I'd be saying maybe talk to Kingston. Um, I'm not sure. Chris, do you have anything to add? I was, I, I, I was listening to Fitzroy's question in, with, with, with interest because it's, it really depends on the context because... It may be a housing matter, it may be a, 
a criminal matter, it may be, it may be an employment matter. And in the absence of a race equality council, a race relations council, I think my starting point would probably be the Citizens Advice yes. Bureau to look at what the legal basis might be for uh, the racism that's, uh, that, 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 that's being experienced. There's an answer in the question there from Bo, suggesting very similar that the, the Law Centre uh, could provide some advice. So I wonder, Fitzroy, whether beginning with the CAB or the Law Centre might be a starting point. Um, can I? Uh, I will just to add to that that in, uh, in, in the borough, um, we've got a hate crime strategy board. Um, that would be a useful point of contact. Um, there is a surgery every Tuesday. So, um, um, and the board is actually formed uh, with a different organization across the borough, including BAME, uh, Metropolitan Police as well, and uh, some reps from the council. So uh, I think that would be a good starting point. I, I just wonder if, if, if that sort of challenge for individuals as a BAME employee within the borough of Merton and as a other BAME individuals in the the community of Merton, shouldn't there be an organization or sh the organization that reflects BAME is BAME Voice? And BAME Voice means a voice for BAME people in the community of Borough. If the BAME Voice was funded and supported in a way that they could initially engage, because they already won over the community in putting this wonderful report together that there is that conduit. Because personally for me, I'm big, black and ugly enough to deal with it myself. I don't need to go through some of the challenges highlighted. And um, as a man of faith, I've got grace and mercy and able to forgive in certain contexts. But the main reason I'm raising it is that if I can't see a pathway that's clear, um, what would somebody in the community um, especially the east of the borough and those who are experiencing um, racism in various forms, shouldn't there be an organisation? Because this is what I've, I'm identifying. I think there needs to be an organisation that the community could reach out to, as Chris highlighted and, and Bo in, in, in the chat. Yes, they may then pass you across and say, this is a case for the Senior Advice Bureau. This is a legal case. You need, you know, so that there's that element of a hub that would be able to support that individual. So then those challenges can be dealt with and emotionally, because mm -hmm. mentally and emotionally, it can affect a lot of families and a lot of individuals and a lot of young people because they're frustrated and there's mm -hmm. cultural issues and there's language barriers and you name it, that they got nowhere, no one or who to go to. And I know people who are crying out for that help and crying out for that support. And I think I'm just kind of raising that because of my experience um, and something that hopefully when the new equality strategy and the tranche of money that's being highlighted, um, it can be something supported within the borough. And I think that would strengthen the borough's position in dealing with racism. And again, as every highlighted, it's very, very difficult to prove. So sometimes you don't want to start the, the discussion or the narrative because you could lose your job, you could be stigmatized, or you're pulling the race card and you name it. Yeah. And in fear, people keep silent and it continues. I think I think if that Chris said it depends what where and what it is, because normally the police would emphasize if you're having um, if you're being you know somebody being racist towards you, report it. If it's at work, as Everett said, then you know you might have somebody there that you can speak to. So it is quite difficult. I think maybe the CAB, if it's an outsider, the CAB will be there to, apart from reporting it to the police or the race hate um, section, you might go to the CAB and see what they can offer you and support you in that aspect. But normally it's just, you know, reported to the police, the race, the race crime, the hate group, and then they might be able to support you or put you down, um, put down your complaints. Yeah, I think, I think you know, maybe the CAB would help. 
Can I come into that? I, Thank I you. Think, Edith, think, you go on. Yes, I think in terms of um, what um, Fitzroy is saying, I understand where he's coming from. I think we fund, the council fund the law society, because as you know, the criminal justice system is very, very, the police haven't got, the, you know, they, they can come in, but they haven't got the, it's not up to them. It's the, you know, the, it has to be the current prosecution service who has to bring a case in law. And as Chris said, it's divided into criminal employment or racial, you know, because if you look at our guidelines, we have all these on our guidelines, but in terms of employment, it has to be done by an employment tribunal and the, the police doesn't get involved. It's all to do with ACAS. I mean, ACAS is a free system to everyone in this country. You know, you can go through ACAS, you know, or if you're a member of a trade union, you can ask your trade union to get involved. But the council fund the Law Society and they have lawyers who are there. I definitely know that because when I was a cabinet member, I worked with them. They have lawyers who are retired, who, give, who, who provide free, I get cases from time to time and they provide free legal advice in terms of criminal employment or any of that. And obviously we work hand in hand with the Law Society, which is down, you know, downstairs. And, you know, it's, um, I think it's a good way which we, we, you know, which the council itself get involved in. But, you know, there are different strands, you know, in terms of the law. The CPS has to bring a case to court and you have to prove beyond reasonable doubt. And it's very, very difficult to mm -hmm. As Chris has said, it depends on the type of case we're looking at. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, know if that helps. That does help and I totally agree with you, but it just strengthens my point. Before it gets to all those legal stages, police, law center, and so forth, if there was a friendly community-based organization and the people in the community knows them and they speak culturally their language and can culturally appropriately communicate to them and they feel relaxed, they can go into that environment. But some people do not like to step it from a position of racism experience straight into mm -hmm. that position. So what I'm actually trying to highlight here, there is a, it's a gap filler. Um, and as I said before, my personal case, I'm, I'm, I said I'm, I'm dealing with that, so it's not a problem. It's not what I'm bringing to the table here. I'm actually highlighting that I feel there is a gap with in the borough in relation to supporting the community who experience racism. And that gap has been around for a long time, not just in Merton, but in London and in, in, in a national level. There needs to, there are some places that have organizations that are able to communicate accordingly and there's others where there needs to be one developed. And I'm just highlighting that there may be a need um, to see if there are others in the community or if the report itself, um, maybe another report that the um, Bain Voice needs to do and hopefully they'll be funded to do it, that they'll be able to say, yes, there is a need for this and then look forward to see whether they're the one supported or some other support is provided. It's not always, I'm, I've been in the UK for, I'm 60 years old now and I came here at 70 uh, from the Windrush generation. So I understand and I experienced racism all my life. And my way of dealing with racism is based on my faith and it strengthens me and it powers me. But I've been through the storm, but I'm saying now there's British born Bain people, mm. British born Bain people who are experiencing racism and mentally it challenges them and affects their mental health. Because when you tell me to go back home, I'm glad, pay for my fear to go to Jamaica and buy me a nice mansion and I will go. <laughs> yeah, but there are other people who do not have that ability to fight back in that way because they were born here, they were raised here, they're British as much as any other culture, and they're dealing with the racism I dealt with when I came here at seven years old. Sorry to be a bit passionate on that one, sorry. Thank you for your passion, yeah. Fitzroy. It is something we all have to go away and think about. Yeah, we can look we can, into it. Yeah, we got to look into it. If we can provide that filler for the 
to support the people who needs it. Because I was racially abused myself. But we're not going to get into that. But let's all go away and think about ways how we can find that filler of support for people. Good point, Fitzroy. Very good point. Okay, any other questions? Well, if no other questions, I would like to wish you all a very good evening and congratulations on the report again to Hannah. Well done and continue to do the good work. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.